So, as part of the uh, last module, uh, uh, we looked at different dependencies uh, such as data dependencies, name dependencies and control dependencies and we also discussed uh, various uh, hazards associated with the dependencies. And in this module, we are going to look at uh, the compiler techniques uh, to exploit instruction level parallelization. So, the compiler can rearrange the instructions in such a way that uh, the overall performance can be improved in the program. The uh, overall performance of the program can be improved. So, here in this, we are going to consider uh, two uh, basic optimizations associated with the compilers. One is the pipeline scheduling, the other one is a loop unrolling. In the case of pipelining scheduling, so, this is also called as a software pipelining. So, we separate the execution of an dependent instruction from the source instruction by the pipeline latency of the source instruction. In other words, let us consider a 5 stage pipeline and uh, if instruction i and j are uh, having data dependency. For example, instruction i is producing a value which is required by instruction j. Now, if I schedule instruction j at least after 5 pipeline cycle times as that of uh, instruction i, then even when there is a dependency, so instruction j will not have any impact because by the time instruction j is uh, going for the execution stage, the instruction i would have completed and uh, return its value uh, to a register. So, as a result, so in the pipeline scheduling concept, so, we have to separate the dependent instructions by a number of cycles which is equal to the number of pipeline stages. So, that the dependent instruction can go ahead with execution without incurring any stall. And the second optimization is the loop unrolling. So, here the loop body will be replicated multiple times. So, that we will have more number of instructions in the loop body. And as a result, we can apply our pipeline scheduling whatever uh, uh, the first technique is proposing and so that we can find more independent instructions and as a result, we can minimize the stalls significantly. So, but the problem with the loop unrolling is uh, it increases the code size. For example, consider uh, uh, a simple loop for i equal to 0, i less than 100, i plus plus, uh, x of i equal to uh, y of i plus z of i. If this is the loop we consider, then the loop body has only one instruction. But whereas, if I unroll this loop 5 times, then effectively the loop body is going to have 5 instructions which are like uh, x of uh, i equal to y of i plus z of i, x of i plus 1 equal to y of i plus 1 plus z of i plus 1 and so on and x of i plus 5, uh, x of i plus 4 is equal to y of i plus 4 plus z of i plus 4. And once we unroll this 5 times, then we have to adjust the terminating condition accordingly. The previously, the loop body was executed for 100 times. Now, the loop body is going to execute for uh, uh, 20 times because the loop body is unrolled 5 times. So, effectively, using pipeline scheduling, we can schedule dependent instructions uh, in such a way that uh, these dependent instructions are separated by uh, some number of pipeline cycles, so that the dependent instructions can get uh, the value from the producer instruction without having any stalls. And once we separate the dependent instruction from the uh, source instruction, we fill this uh, the slots with the other instructions in the program and uh, using the loop unrolling. We unroll the loop body such a way that the loop body now going to have more number of instructions and uh, once we have more number of instructions, we can uh, uh, try to see whether pipeline scheduling can be applied on this uh, unrolled loop body uh, so that uh, we can minimize the number of stalls associated with the, uh, the dependencies in the program. So, in other words, so, we exploit both pipeline scheduling and the loop unrolling to minimize the stalls associated with this dependencies in the program and uh, improve the overall uh, the performance of uh, the system. 
So, we explain these two concepts by considering a uh, set of examples in this uh, module. Before discussing the example, we will consider uh, our uh, the basic uh, pipeline unit. We use that unit for uh, executing our uh, sequence of instructions given in our examples. So, we consider a multi cycle functional units in our uh, system, where we considered a four stage pipelining for floating point adder and one pipeline stage for uh, the integer uh, unit. And uh, our remaining stages that is the instruction fetch, instruction decode, memory uh, access and write back all are taking a single pipeline cycle. So, given this pipeline design, so when we apply operand forwarding for uh, minimizing unnecessary stalls for our uh, instructions, these are the latencies that the uh, dependent instruction can incur uh, with respect to the producing instruction. So, if there is a floating point ALU operation is uh, executed in the uh, pipeline and if there is a trailing floating point uh, ALU operation which requires the value produced by the leading floating point uh, ALU instruction, then this trailing instruction has to incur a latency of 3 cycles to get the value produced by the leading instruction. In other words, let us assume that instruction i and j are following in the program order where instruction i is coming before instruction j and both these instructions are floating point uh, ALU instructions. And now, instruction j can get the value supplied by instruction i only after 3 cycles of latency. The reason is in this particular case we can see here instruction i produces the value only at the end of 6 cycle because the, the floating point instruction will follow through this pipeline path and uh, at the end of 6 cycle it will complete the execution and as a result it is ready to forward the value whatever is computed by the floating point adder to any dependent instruction. Because instruction i is issued in cycle let us say t and instruction j can be issued only at uh, the cycle uh, t plus 1. So, that means already the instruction j is delayed by one, one pipeline cycle and now instruction j requires the operand the source operand only at the start of the third cycle. And we know that instruction i is producing the value at the end of 6 cycle and instruction j requires an operand in its third uh, cycle because instruction j is already issued one cycle delayed to the instruction i. So, effectively uh, the instruction j can get the value with the forwarding only after 3 clock cycles when instruction j is scheduled one cycle uh, later to the instruction i. And if you consider instruction j is a store instruction and instruction i is a floating point uh, ALU instruction. In that case, instruction j requires at least 2 cycles stall. The reason is the in instruction j is now going through this path because this is a store instruction, the store instruction will go through this and this integer execute stage is required for store operation because the store operation has to compute the effective address and for F computing the effective address calculation we use integer unit and which is going to take uh, one uh, pipeline cycle. And now because instruction j is scheduled one cycle later to instruction i and instruction i is producing the value at the end of sixth uh, cycle and instruction j which is a store instruction requires the value only at the start of its fourth cycle. So, in other words instruction j requires the value at the start of fourth cycle and instruction i is producing the value at the end of sixth cycle, but instruction uh, j is scheduled one cycle later to instruction i effectively uh, the instruction j requires a two cycle stall or two cycle delay. So, that is what is given here. And now consider uh, the other scenario where instruction i is a load instruction and instruction j is a floating point uh, ALU instruction 
and we know that the load instruction will follow through this path because there is an effective address calculation for which we require integer ALU unit. So, load will complete the memory read operation at the end of its fourth cycle and because the uh, uh, floating point instruction requires the value at the start of its third cycle. So, as a result uh, uh, it requires one cycle delay or one pipeline stall will be there if you want to schedule the floating point ALU in instruction immediately after one cycle delay to the, the load instruction. And finally, if we have uh, two instructions one is a load double and the other one is a store double and the load is producing a value which is required by the store instruction. In this scenario there is no uh, delay associated with that or it is not going to create any stall. The reason is the load is producing the value at the end of the fourth cycle and the store is requiring the value at the start of the fourth cycle because the store instruction is scheduled one cycle later to the load instruction. So, as a result by the time store requires the data uh, the load is read the value from the memory and as a result uh, using this load forwarding concept we can supply the data to the store instruction. And remember both the load and store will follow the same pipeline path which is instruction fetch decode uh, integer execute stage memory. So, as a result like there is no stall for a subsequent store operation which requires the value produced by the leading the load instruction. So, we use these the delays in our uh, the calculations uh, uh, for an example that we consider in the next file. So, consider a simple example here this is a for loop for i equal to 999 i greater than or equal to 0 i minus minus and we are computing this loop body which has a single instruction x of i equal to x of i plus s and this loop body is executed for 1000 times. We are performing this operation on an array which has 1000 elements and we read a value from the array and we add some constant to that and finally, we store the value back into the same location in the array and this array has 1000 elements and we perform this operation 1000 times and each time we are performing operation on a single uh, uh, array element. Effectively, this operation requires loading the value from the array, adding a constant to that value and storing the value back to the array because the array is stored in our memory. So, we require a load operation followed by add operation followed by store operation. When we convert this simple C code into assembly language then this is what the, the set of instructions. It consists of load because we are performing all these on uh, the floating point uh, doubles. So, effectively each floating point double is going to take 8 bytes of space and uh, when we use the instructions also we have to specify that effectively. So, here we are considering L dot D is load double. Similarly, add dot D is performing add operation on two double uh, um, values and similarly store double and so on. So, we load a value from uh, location in the array or location in the memory which is specified by 0 of R 1. So, here in this code all uh, the contents which are specified with f indicates the floating point registers and all contents which are specified with r indicates that these are the integer registers. So, effectively r 1, r 2 are integer registers here and f 0, uh, f 2, f 4 are floating point uh, registers. And r 1 is actually r 1 is initially having some value and uh, we uh, load some data which is stored in an address. Uh, which is specified by the contents of R1. So, we go to the memory and we get the value from that and we load the value to the floating point register F0. And then because once we read the value from the ith location in the array we have to add uh, some constant to that value. So, that constant is stored in another floating point register which is F2. So, we perform an add operation on the contents of F0 which has the value from the read from the memory and F2 has a constant value and these two are added and the result is stored in another floating point register F4. 
and once this add operation is completed, now we are going to write the contents of F4 to the memory location which is specified by R1 because we are going to write to the same memory location from which we read the earlier value. So, effectively we are going to write to the memory location which is specified by 0 of R1. So, once we perform this store operation, next we are going to decrement the R1 value because we have to now pointing to the second uh, array location. So, that is specified by R1 minus 8. So, we are performing this, uh, this is an immediate uh, addressing mode is used. So, we have this minus 8. So, we are going to decrement uh, uh, R1 by 8. In other words, we perform an add operation with uh, R1 and uh, minus 8. So, that now R1 is pointing to uh, next location which is 8 bytes away from the previous location. So, that we can get the next floating point uh, value that is stored at that particular address. And after this add operation is performed to set our uh, the subscript value, now we will check whether the condition is true or false. Because we are going to execute this loop uh, only for 1000 times and every time after every iteration of this loop body, we have to see whether the condition is satisfied or not. So, branch not equal condition is checked here with respect to uh, the R1 and R2. So, we are going to see whether R1 value is equal to R2 or not. If R1 is not equal to R2, then we will jump to uh, the instruction which is pointed by this loop. So, that is effectively we are again start reading the second a value from the memory by using the load operation and then we will perform an add store and we will continue. And if this condition is false, then we will exit this loop and then we will continue with the uh, subsequent instruction after this branch instruction. So, this is a piece of code for our uh, the high level language code here and now we will see how much time this code is going to take to execute. Uh, uh, after considering the, the stalls associated with the dependencies between these instructions. And we know that, so this add instruction is actually dependent on load because it is using this F0 which is produced by load and similarly store is dependent on add because uh, uh, the store has to wait for the add to be performed. And uh, so this add operation cannot be executed before the store operation because if we perform this add operation, then it is going to change the R1 content as a result the store operation is going to perform on wrong, uh, different location. So, as a result this add i is also dependent on store instruction and uh, finally, this branch instruction is dependent on this add instruction because it is using this R1. So, R1 is updated in uh, add instruction here and as a result. Uh, this branch cannot be executed before uh, the add instruction. Effectively, there is a dependency among uh, the different instructions in this code and as a result, if we schedule these instructions as it is, we are going to get significant uh, penalty in terms of stalls. So, when we schedule these instructions as it is, so we are going to have these many number of stalls. So, here we can clearly see so, this is a floating point, uh, this is a load operation and there is a floating point uh, ALU operation and which is taking one cycle stall. Because we know that from the previous uh, file, we know that the load instruction and there is a floating point uh, ALU instruction, then the floating point ALU instruction will wait for one cycle to get the value supplied by the load. So, as a result like uh, this add operation cannot be executed immediately after the load instruction. So, it has to incur one cycle stall or it has to be delayed by one pipeline cycle. So, that uh, the value produced by load will be available and uh, add can perform its operation. And similarly, there is a store instruction, this is a consumer instruction and there is a floating point uh, add instruction which is a producer. So, a floating point ALU operation is producing a value which is required by uh, the store instruction. So, which is going to take uh, 
two pipeline stalls because uh, we know that the store instruction which is dependent on the previous floating point ALU operation which requires two pipeline cycles. Remember that these latencies are after applying this operand forwarding or load forwarding techniques. And finally, there is a branch instruction which is uh, uh, dependent on the previous add instruction and which is actually requiring one cycle. So, because the branch is actually computed in the second stage of our uh, pipeline, but the add is going to produce the value only at the end of the, the execute stage. So, as a result it has to wait for uh, one cycle. Though we have not mentioned uh, uh, the delay associated with the branch instruction and an uh, um, integer ALU operation in this uh, the table, but because uh, we are using the same 5 stage pipeline design whatever we consider in the fundamentals of uh, pipelining design and where uh, our uh, the uh, branch condition will be completed in the second stage that is the ID stage itself. And so, as a result uh, our branch instruction requires uh, the one cycle stall compared to the uh, uh, with respect to the, the previous integer uh, ALU operation. So, as a result, so without any pipeline scheduling, if we schedule these instructions as it is, so we are going to complete this task or one iteration of the loop in 9 cycles and in these 9 cycles, the 4 cycles are just the stalls and the 5 cycles are actually performing uh, the computation required uh, with respect to that uh, the loop body. And remember, in these 5 instructions, these 3 instructions are actually performing the required operations which is like uh, load, add and store. But the last 2 instructions are actually the overhead associated with this uh, the for loop. So, one is decrementing the, the iteration uh, value and the other one is the branch condition check. So, effectively these 2 are overheads for performing one iteration of the loop. Effectively for every iteration we are going to incur 2 extra instructions and also because of the dependencies among the instructions we are in addition to these 2 extra instructions we are also incurring extra 4 stalls. In other words out of these 9 cycles that we incur for executing uh, one iteration of the loop we are actually wasting 6 pipeline cycles time because of either the stalls or because of the overhead associated with this uh, the loop iterations. Now without worrying about the a loop iteration overhead. If we schedule these instructions using the pipeline scheduling concept, we can minimize these stalls. So, now you can see here in the pipeline scheduling, the compiler rearranges this code in such a way that. So, we move this integer ALU instruction uh, before the floating point uh, ALU operation. And uh, after that, uh, we have not rearranged any of the other instructions. So, now we can see here, we know that floating point add instruction requires the value supplied by our load instruction, but it takes one cycle stall if you are executing the add instruction immediately after the load instruction. And now, in order to minimize this stall, what we can do is we fill this pipeline cycle with uh, this stall with a useful instruction that is add instruction. So, when we move this add instruction here, we are not incurring any stall and we delay the floating point add operation by one more cycle and by the time this add operation comes to the execute stage, our load is having the value and using the load forwarding, we can supply the value to the ALU operation. So, as a result, uh, this add operation is not going to incur any more uh, stalls and that minimizes the stall associated with this add instruction with respect to the load. But now, we already discussed earlier, our store operation actually dependent on the integer ALU operation and we mentioned that 
our integer ALU operation should not be moved before the store operation because when we move uh, this uh, integer ALU operation before the store operation then store is going to uh, write the value to a different location because already this integer ALU operation a decremented R1 value by 8. So in order not to have any impact we rearrange or we uh, format this SD instruction also. We do some changes to this store instruction such a way that previously our store instruction has 0 of R1 now our store instruction has 8 of R1. This indicates that we calculate the effective address by adding 8 to the contents of R1. Already R1 is decremented by 8. So now new R1 is going to be the old R1 minus 8 and for that we are going to add 8. So effectively we are pointing to the, the old R1 value. So as a result there won't be any change and the store is going to perform uh, the store operation to the correct location in the memory. So as a result there won't be any correctness issue with the program. And after that there is a branch instruction. Previously this branch instruction was incurring one pipeline stall because this is waiting for R1 to be computed by the integer ALU operation. But now this R1 is already computed way ahead with respect to the schedule of this branch instruction. So as a result uh, it is not going to have any uh, the stall. So because of this pipeline scheduling we minimized uh, the number of stalls from 4 to 2. So as a result with this pipeline scheduling now we have only 2 stalls per iteration. So as a result out of this 1000 iterations for uh, 1000 iterations of this loop now we are going to have uh, uh, 2000 stalls as compared to the 4000 stalls uh, that we incur uh, by using uh, no pipeline scheduling mechanism. So effectively by using this pipeline scheduling for this simple code we minimize the stalls significantly almost 50 percent of the stalls are uh, minimized by using this pipeline scheduling. But still here we have not eliminated the overhead associated with uh, this uh, the iteration overhead that is corresponding to the performing this integer ALU operation to decrement the the subscript value and then branch condition check. So in order to minimize the overhead associated with these two instructions what we have to do is we have to exploit the loop unrolling. So when we conserve the loop unrolling, when we unroll the loop by 5 times for example, so we need the overhead associated with this the iterations only one for every the five instructions. The previously in our uh, uh, unrolled in, in our base uh, the instructions we know that we have to compute the branch condition and we have to change the subscript at every iteration of the loop body and the loop body consists of only one instruction. So effectively for every one instruction we have to change the subscript as well as we have to change uh, we have to check the branch condition. So as a result uh, our overhead is significant with respect to this loop body iterations. But when we consider uh, loop unrolling and if we unroll the loop by 5 times we can minimize the overhead associated with this iterations 5 times. We minimize the overheads associated with this loop iterations by uh, almost 5x. So in other words when we unroll the loop for example 4 times in this scenario so our uh, rather than performing uh, add operation on a single element we are now going to perform add operations on 4 elements. So effectively we have a total of uh, 3 into 4 which is 12 instructions plus 2 extra instructions associated with the loop body iterations. So these two are the instructions associated with the loop body iterations one is for changing the loop subscript and the other one is checking the condition and the remaining 12 instructions are associated with a load add and store for each of the instructions because there are 4 instructions in the loop body and each instruction is going to take a load add and a store effectively 12 instructions for this plus 2 instructions. So we have 14 instructions when we unroll the loop 4 times 
and uh, so this total computation is going to take a total of 27 cycles in that 14 cycles are required to perform these operations and 13 cycles are required for stalls. These 13 cycles are because of one cycle stall between this integer ALU operation and the branch condition and uh, one cycle stall between this the load instruction and an add instruction and two cycle stall between add instruction and a store instruction. Because we have four such pairs of load and add in this code, so we have four cycle stall and four pairs of add and store, we have eight stalls, effectively 12 stalls plus one stall 13. So when we unroll the loop four times, we are going to take a total of 27 cycles to execute the loop body which consists of uh, four instructions in it. And remember when we unroll the loop we have not applied any pipeline scheduling. So as a result uh, uh, there is a scope to minimize these stalls if we apply pipeline scheduling. So when we combine this loop unrolling with pipeline scheduling, so we eliminate all the stalls effectively our uh, unrolled loop executes without any stall but we exploited the pipeline scheduling also here after unrolling the loop. So when we unroll and then apply pipeline scheduling we can rearrange the instructions in such a way that all the dependent instructions are delayed by a time which is uh, more than the time the dependent instruction is going to uh, get the value from the producer. So now you can see here all the load instructions are scheduled before the add instructions and the store instructions. Now we can clearly see this add instruction requires a value uh, produced by this load instruction and in earlier case when we schedule this add instruction immediately after the load it is going to take one cycle stall but now this add is separated with respect to this load by three other instructions. So as a result by the time this comes for the execution this is already produced the value. So as a result there is no stall for this add instruction. Similarly this add is separated with this load by another three instructions. So this also can get the data without any stall and that can be explained for the other add instructions also. And previously this store is taking two cycle stall with respect to this add because add is supplying the data only after uh, two cycle uh, delay. So but now this store is actually requiring the data from this add and these two are separated by three other add instructions. So as a result which is more than the delay uh, incurred by the store previously with respect to this add. So there is no stall for the store operation and it can peacefully get the data from uh, produced by this add instruction and that can be explained for the other store operations also. And this add instruction is scheduled two cycles ahead of this branch instruction. So as a result this branch instruction not going to incur any stall associated with this add instruction. So we eliminated all the stalls in the code. So as a result uh, this overall the loop body is going to take 14 cycles to execute. Effectively four instructions are completed uh, with 14 cycles and uh, none of these instructions are incurring any stalls. So as a result we can improve the overall performance. So this shows that the compiler looks at the independent instructions and uh, even if the dependency is there, the compiler can rearrange these instructions in such a way that it can minimize the stalls so that the overall performance can be improved. And in order to do that the compiler applies the concepts such as uh, the pipeline scheduling and loop unrolling. Loop unrolling gives a larger scope for rearranging the instructions and once we increase the scope then we apply our pipeline scheduling on top of that so that uh, we can schedule the instructions properly uh, and minimize the stalls significantly in our code that improves the overall performance. So with that I am uh, concluding this module and in the next module we are going to uh, discuss the techniques associated with the, uh, the hardware mechanisms to improve uh, the overall uh, performance of a superscalar pipeline design. Thank you.